Welcome to Dermatologically Tested, the podcast of the British Association of Dermatologists with Matt Gass and Nina Gade. On this podcast, we'll be exploring the world of our skin with a range of dermatological experts, tackling topics from the clinical to the cosmetic. Today, we'll be chatting about hair and focusing on hair loss, why it happens and what you can do about it. So, I suspect this one will have a pretty broad appeal. I think for a lot of people, their hair is central to their identity. And, you know, you have a, a sort of mental image of yourself almost. And it's very hard to maybe get, get to grips for some people with that change. So I think there's going to be a lot of people that want to learn more about how to manage hair loss and, you know, what you can do about it. But I also think it's, it's good to tackle it because there's so much misinformation out there about hair loss. Yeah, I think you're right that it's quite a broad topic because obviously it does affect women as well as men, although often when we think of hair loss, we think of men and only associating hair loss with the ageing process. But obviously we know that's not the case. It affects men and women and can start younger in life. Um, So, yeah, this is quite an interesting topic and will appeal to lots of people, I think. Yeah, you're right. It's going to be really good to tease out some of the different types of hair loss and get to the bottom of what those differences are and, and what implications that has for treatments. So our guest today is Dr. Sharon Wong. Sharon is a consultant dermatologist and she's an expert on hair loss. Thanks for joining us today, Sharon, and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. I think a really good place to kick off would just be to ask quite simply, why do we lose our hair? Well, our hair is quite an amazing structure. Um, And of course, it's the product of your hair follicle, which is a little mini organ that sits in your skin. And um, each hair follicle is undergoing a life cycle, uh, independent of its next door neighbor. So it goes through a growing phase, then it goes through a short stationary phase, then it goes to a resting phase. And at the end of the resting phase, that old hair is pushed out because there is a new fiber that's coming through. And every single one of our hair follicles is going round this growth cycle over and over again throughout our entire lifespan. So the, the reason why it can do that is because it has reservoirs of stem cells that enable us to regenerate hair as we naturally shed it. And so that's why naturally on a day-to-day basis, we will shed hair. And normally on a healthy scalp, you can have anywhere between 100,000 to 150,000 hair follicles. So you can actually shed up to 100 hairs per day, and that'd be quite normal. I mean, that's really interesting. I think one of my main questions actually was, we're all aware we all lose hair on a daily basis. You only have to to sort of look around after you've had a shower or whatever to, to notice that. But at what point should we be concerned? Is there a point where this natural hair loss actually borders on a disorder or actually becomes a disorder? Sure. So I think you will probably be able to notice if you are losing a significantly greater amount of hair than you normally shed. And typically patients will say, you know, clumps of hair or handfuls of hair uh, are coming out in the shower or when I'm combing it. And of course, that is a deviation from your normal amount of hair shedding. And with that, a lot of patients will notice a, a dramatic shrinkage in the volume of hair that they have. So that's clearly a deviation from their baseline. And so there can be lots of potential triggers for this increase increased amount of shedding. So if you do notice a disproportionate amount of hair that's coming out on a daily basis, then do go and see your doctor for some baseline investigations, because it could be just something as simple as a nutritional deficiency or hormonal imbalances, which could be corrected. Um, There are a host of other um, hair loss conditions and different causes of hair loss, of course. And I think if your scalp is unhappy, it's inflamed, uh, or it feels like it's itchy or burning, or if you've got any boils or spots on the scalp associated with that hair loss, um, it is also time to go and see your doctor and potentially get referred to see a dermatologist um, for further investigation. Perfect. I think that's a really key question that comes up again and again in dermatology is is when do I go see the doctor? And, you know, at what point is this this, uh, an issue that, you know, I can't handle myself so I think it's really good to address that nice and early actually and also I think it's really important that um, types of hair loss which may be deemed by some people as more cosmetic and I I say that very loosely such as common balding I think if it's reaching a point that it's really negatively having an impact on you and your emotional and psychological well-being I think you know you need to see somebody about it because more often than not there is something that you can do at the very least to slow down progression but the point is if your hair loss is making you feel like you can't go out uh, or make you feel depressed I think it really is time to go and see somebody about it and to not feel ashamed about seeing someone. 
Yeah, I think that's really important to get across, actually, because, you know, like you say, I see it a lot in young men, I think, that because it's normalised to a large degree, some people who find it difficult to handle the process of losing your hair and so on, there can be a sort of feeling that they need to just suck it up and internalise it. And I think that actually that's not a good solution if it's really affecting your day-to-day life. So, yeah, it's great to, to just remind people that, you know, that's what your doctor's there for to, to go if you're if you're struggling with something. Absolutely. And I think hair is such an emotive topic. Um, obviously, hair loss in the majority of cases isn't associated with really any serious health issue, but it really is an emotive topic and your hair means something very different to you as an individual. So whilst one person will quite happily embrace the balding process, that is not necessarily the case for another person. Definitely. I mean, we touched on one type of hair loss there, but perhaps you could explain to, to people listening the different types of hair loss that there are and, and how they affect people. Sure. So it's a great question because it clarifies um, a common misconception that hair loss or alopecia is just one condition. But the truth is that there are many different types, many different causes, and each needing a slightly different approach. And actually also that more than one type can actually coexist in the same person. So worldwide, the commonest type of hair loss is genetic hair loss or common balding. The medical term is androgenetic alopecia, which is due to a combination of genetic factors as well as hormonal influences and I'm sure we all recognize the different patterns so in men it's called male pattern balding and there is um, a gradual recession of the hairline and or thinning on the crown in women it's called female pattern hair loss and typically the hairline is preserved there is this gradual thinning out of hair over the crown and the frontal scalp Another relatively common form of hair loss affecting approximately two in every thousand people in the UK is alopecia areata. And this is a very specific form of hair loss that's thought to be autoimmune in nature, meaning that it's the patient's own immune system that is attacking the growing hair follicle and causing that growth to arrest. And patients will typically present with a sudden onset of these circular patches of hair loss, most commonly on the scalp, but really any hair bearing site can be affected. So eyebrows, eyelashes, beard is quite a common area and less commonly the body. And then a third very common form of hair loss doesn't give you patches of hair loss per se, but it just presents with really dramatic shedding from all over the scalp. And this is this entity called telogen effluvium. And it happens as a result of this disturbance in the proportion of hairs in the growing versus shedding phase. And there are some really common triggers, examples being after pregnancy, so that postpartum shed that a lot of women have about three months after birth. This is telogen effluvium, and it's due to the sort of renormalization of the sex hormones after pregnancy. Other common triggers would be psychological trauma, nutritional deficiencies, illnesses, particularly ones which give you a high fever. So we've certainly seen some post-COVID, for example. So these three are probably the top three most common causes of hair loss. And and they're they're classified as non-scarring forms, meaning that there is a potential to reverse that hair loss uh, and bring the hair back. Now, this contrasts with a rarer group of hair loss disorders, which are known as scarring alopecias. And as the name suggests, this group of conditions can actually inflame the hair follicle and eventually replace that hair follicle with scar tissue. And of course, hair doesn't grow through scar tissue, so you can be left with permanent areas of hair loss. And it's this group that typically is associated with some inflammation on the scalp. So patients will report itching or burning, or they might see some bumps and boils on their scalp. So it's really important to seek medical attention if you're noticing that. And then there are some others which we call biphasic. So in the early stages, they start off as completely reversible. But if they're left to fester, they will become scarring. And a classical example would be traction alopecia, which is the hair loss that you get as a result of pulling forces, which are applied to the hair repetitively by wearing your hair in really tight hairstyles. So in the early stages, it's reversible if you stop wearing your hair in tight hairstyles. But later down the line, it just scars your hair follicles and hair loss becomes permanent. So really with that, those are just the main common ones. There are a whole host of other less common forms of hair loss. So it really is much more of a complex entity than just hair loss as one condition itself. Yeah, I mean, complex was the word that sprung to my mind. Um, <laughs> there's certainly a lot going on there and, you know, a lot of potential 
triggers. But that's really interesting. It's good to give people that sort of good grounding and understanding of what we're going to be talking about, I think. One thing I wanted to touch on is the type of person that hair loss happens to seems to affect a, a lot of people I know in various different guises. But are there some people who are more susceptible to hair loss and to different types of hair loss? Or, or is it slightly luck of the draw? Uh, no, there, so there are certain cohorts of patients who are more susceptible to certain types of hair loss. So if you took genetic hair loss, for example, if you have a very strong family history with members of your family also going thin, bold, especially from an early age, um, then you are potentially more susceptible to developing the same at an early age as well. And then there will be different types of hair loss, which are more likely to happen at different times of your life. So I mentioned previously about the postpartum shedding that a lot of women get usually about three months after giving birth. And that happens because during pregnancy, the rises in estrogens and progesterones maintain your hair in the growing phase artificially, whereas they should normally just be cycling through towards the shedding phase, but they're being artificially kept in the growing phase. So the whole thing about pregnant women having thick, luscious locks is not a myth, actually. It happens to most women who are pregnant. But after pregnancy, you get that decline back towards the pre-pregnant sex hormone levels. And it's that decline in those um, estrogen and progesterone levels that mean that all those hairs will then transit to the shedding phase at the same time. And that's when you get that really dramatic shed. Similarly, women who reach the menopause, there is a dramatic decline in estrogens and a relative rise in the male hormones. So the ratio between female and male hormones declines. So the relative increase in androgens or male hormones can get picked up by your hair follicles and also kickstart um, the balding process and the generalized thinning and shedding as well. In terms of hair types, patients who have Afro hair most definitely are more susceptible to a unique set of challenges when it comes to hair and scalp problems. And that's really down to a combination of them having a really fragile and delicate hair type together with very common hairstyling practices, which are quite traumatic to the hair fiber, but also to the hair follicle as well. Sharon, you mentioned their hair types, um, and that's really interesting. What exactly are those hair types? Uh, well, historically, if you look at really old books, um, they talk about hair types in three groups based on ethnicity. So they, they classify hair types into African hair, Caucasian hair and Asian hair. And of course, we know that that is completely arbitrary and it's not representative of what we have in the real world. And since then, there have been a more representative grading scales to, to classify the different hair types based on texture. But nevertheless, it is still quite helpful to have three points along that vast spectrum to compare the hair types and then mechanical physical properties. So if you just looked at Afro hair, it's obviously a curly hair type, but the actual curl pattern isn't usually regular. If anything, it's highly irregularly irregular because you have coils, you have kinks, you have twists. Um, and every point at which the hair direction changes is a geometrically weak point of that hair fiber. But not just that, a curly hair fiber is much more likely to knot both within the same strand and with neighboring strands. So what you have at baseline with Afro hair is a delicate fiber, which is much more prone to knotting. Adding into the mix a set of hairstyling practices, which are very common. So things like braids, weaves, cane rows, locks, and the use of chemical relaxers. Those two factors together mean that this particular group of patients are much more likely to get hair breakage, traction alopecia, but also we know there is a specific form of scarring alopecia, um, which used to be called hot comb alopecia, actually, when it was first um, reported in African-American women in the late 1960s, when hot combing was the fashionable thing to do to straighten hair. It's since been renamed now as central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, or CCCA. And we know that there is a genetic predisposition amongst black patients. The condition is brought out by traumatic hairstyling practices. So it sounds like there's different ways that people can lose hair almost, even within one hair type. So if your hair is prone to breakage, you might notice that you're losing hair, but actually it might just be hair from halfway down the hair shaft rather than the whole hair. But then styling practices might lead to hair literally from the root. Is that right? Like traction alopecia is the hair coming out from the root there rather than sort of snapping off halfway down. 
Yes, that's absolutely spot on. So another way of sort of classifying how you can lose hair is that you've got conditions that affect the hair follicle, so the living part of the hair, so to speak. Or, uh, and then you've got processes or factors that can affect the actual health of the fiber. Um, so you've got hair shaft problems, the commonest of which is weathering from excessive styling. So the use of heat and the use of chemicals repeatedly. To some extent, we all have you know, weathering of hair as a result of these practices. But the Afro hair type is particularly delicate, partly as well because of the cuticle layer. So we all know we have the cuticle as the outermost layer of our hair fiber. And when you magnify into the cuticle, it's actually made from protein, so keratin tiles, which are overlapping one another, a bit like tiles on a roof, which of course is much more effective at forming a protective seal against a flat surface. So you can imagine what happens with the cuticle layer against a curved or twisted surface, you're going to get more gaps in the cuticle layer. So typically Afro hair is more porous and it means that it retains less moisture. And dryness of Afro hair is definitely one of the main problems that a lot of patients complain about, but it also heavily influences the type of products they choose. So you'll often find people with Afro hair will choose butters, oils, but also sometimes heavier products like waxes and pomades, which is fine for the hair fiber. But when it's also put onto the scalp, it can lead to a whole host of other problems on their scalp, like buildup, scaling, eczema and dandruff, and also clogged hair follicles and folliculitis. It sounds like a very challenging picture of how best to manage your hair whilst held to, to standards and, you know, accepted beauty standards and expectations on, on how your hair should look. It seems like a, an absolute minefield. And you've really hit on a very um, important point here. And I think, you know, historically, there hasn't ever been that much attention paid towards hair loss in a lady of Afro-Caribbean descent. And it's always thought this is completely self-inflicted. But I think you need to delve deeper into the layers as to why such patients actually go through those hairstyling practices. And you'll find that there is a complex web of historical, societal and cultural pressures and factors which have influenced their choice of hairstyling practices. And I think it's deeply unfair to just say, you know, you did this to yourself and, you know, traction alopecia, go away and wear a wig. You know, I think we need to be a lot more understanding about the pressures that this cohort of patients have faced over centuries, which have really influenced their styling practices. And as a result, have unfortunately are much more prone to getting certain hair and scalp problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's really important to mention. So Sharon, looking at the problems that you've mentioned that are more specific to Afro type hair, is there anything that people can do to minimise, say, breakage or, you know, hair coming out from the scalp? Absolutely. And it is all about prevention. And I think there is this um, movement now towards embracing the natural hair texture. And it's great because you can see sort of the educational work that's going around that encouraging the younger generation to really embrace their natural beauty and their natural hair texture. But really, in terms of choosing products that you're using to suit Afro hair types, there isn't obviously an issue using heavier products on the actual hair fiber. The issue is obviously when you're applying it onto the scalp directly can cause issues with things like buildup and scaling and eczema. So I normally say, by all means, if you need to condition well with using these heavier products, go from mid shaft down. Technically, any hair that's damaged is damaged for good. Things like um, deep conditioning treatments are really there just to temporarily improve the manageability, the shine and the feel of the hair. Ultimately, let's say when you've got split ends, etc., the best thing to do is to make sure that you go for a trim every eight weeks or so, because damaged hair is damaged. It's non-living material, so it doesn't regenerate in that sense. So going to see your hairdresser regularly, getting the ends trimmed, but also minimizing the amount of heat which is applied to the hair. And this is across all hair types. But if you really can't go without heat styling, making sure that you use a heat protective serum or spray. And I think people forget about the damage that UV can have on your hair as well. So it can denature and break down the proteins, which of course your hair is 90% protein. So if you are on summer holiday or if it's really warm here and you're out and about a lot, then maybe thinking about leave-in conditioners with UV filters or maybe tying your hair up loosely and wearing it under a hat. Um, so those are the sorts of things that you can, we can all do, actually, to maintain the health of the fibre. Because there's one thing addressing hair loss conditions which are affecting the hair follicle and how well the hair grows, but we can do a lot to actually manage the aesthetic and the health of our hair fibre, the actual hair shaft itself. 
And I think, obviously, something that needs to go alongside that is, you know, society slightly changing some of the old-fashioned views, you know, maybe in the office, what's an acceptable hairstyle. And you see a lot of controversy these days with slightly old-fashioned organisations saying that one type of hair is professional and another one isn't. And I think that seems like that's something that really needs to change as well. I absolutely agree. And I think the narrative is changing, which is great to see, because you're absolutely right in certain workplaces, in the advertising, media, beauty world. Historically, this perception of beauty has always been portrayed as the Caucasian type hair. And that is what one of the major driving factors has been for all these young girls really processing their hair from a really early stage. And by the time they're in their teens, they've got irreversible damage quite large areas of traction alopecia, which isn't reversible. And it's just such a shame because that is what has been portrayed to them as being beautiful. And that's what they're trying to achieve. So, you know, minimizing the amount of trauma to the hair by leaving your hair loose, wearing it natural. And, in, you know, I'm a great advocate of the fact that actually less is more when it comes to hair styling and your hair health. So it's really striking that balance. But I think you're absolutely right that the narrative does need to change. And there are some early signs that it is doing now. Moving on to other causes of hair loss. Anecdotally, I've heard people talk about, you know, stress causing their hair to fall out. And it's something that's in common parlance when you talk about pulling your hair out and things. Is there any link between, you know, your emotional well-being and stress and hair falling out? Can it trigger hair loss if you're extremely stressed? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's what is often referred as the stress stress connection. And we see real life examples day to day in clinic. And one of the commonest types of hair loss as a result of emotional trauma and stress is this telogen effluvium. So this dramatic increase in hair shedding. Now, it doesn't tend to happen immediately after that stressful event. It's usually a good couple of months, two to three months after, then the shedding appears. And again, it's one of these factors that can trigger an upset of the hair growth cycle so that a greater proportion of your hair follicles come out of the growing phase prematurely and into the shedding phase. So that's one type of stress-related hair loss that we commonly see in clinic. Another type in some, but not all patients with alopecia areata, and that's where you have these circular patches of, of hair loss. Some patients do report a period that's been very stressful, predating them finding the first patch of hair loss. But it's not all just hearsay. So there is some science behind this and it has been researched. So what we do know is that when we're under stress, our brain can release these neurochemical substances, which have been shown to have a direct inhibitory effect on our hair follicles. And they've replicated the same scenario in the lab as well. So they've taken human hair follicles, cultured them in the lab and added in these new chemical substances and found the same issue that the hair growth is inhibited so we definitely have a biological pathway to explain why the stress and the hair loss is connected in patient we talked already about how to minimize the sort of hair loss that comes about from you know breakage and certain hairstyles that cause things like traction alopecia but if somebody's concerned about their hair loss and it's not linked to their hair styling or you know heat treatments, is there anything that they can do to halt or slow down the process? For example, if your hair's falling out just through aging, is there anything you can actually do to slow that down? Or is it, you know, just a natural part of life and you have to deal with it? Well, I think if it's aging, then, you know, as with all bodily systems, our um, cell turnover is slower. And equally, the, the same happens with your hair follicles. So you'll find that your hair actually doesn't grow as long or as well as it used to. But this is a very slow and very progressive change that you wouldn't really panic about as such. But I think ultimately, if you have noticed a more sudden change in your hair in terms of how it's growing or whether you're shedding more hair or if you're getting any scalp symptoms associated with it, the single most important thing is to make sure you actually see someone to get a diagnosis first, because they really, you know, that you cannot meaningfully actually address or treat the hair problem if you don't actually know what factors are relevant in your case. And as we outlined before, there are so many different types and so many different causes of hair loss. It would just be a waste of time really trying anything you know that's just off the shelf or something that your friend recommended because it may not work for you because you might have a completely different type of hair loss but I think you know things that patients can do themselves at home when they are seeing their doctor and they're, they're being investigated but there are things that um, you can do to try and 
minimize any further loss or maximize the health of your hair. And we talked about how to look after the exterior of your hair by minimizing you know, styling related damage. But I think also trying not to panic is really important. And I know it's easier said than done because your hair is something that you just tend to every day. So you can't really easily ignore it. But, but I just see it time and time again where patients become so stressed and so anxious about their hair loss that they become preoccupied by it. And before they know it, that is the only thing they can think of um, in the whole day. And they often can spiral into sort of anxiety and low mood. So I think diverting that stress at an early stage is really important. Um, and that might be something as simple as engaging in relaxation techniques like mindfulness or meditation or maybe a signposting patients to um, support groups. The other thing to think about is your diet. I think um, we can all do better really with our diet and have, make sure that we aren't potentially depriving our hair follicles from any particular macro or micronutrient. And there's no quick fix and there's no secret here. It really is just a broad spectrum of foods that you take in a well-balanced diet. And that's what your hair follicles require. So those are things that you can do to self-care whilst establishing what the actual cause is for your hair problem. So one thing it would be good to just clear up a little bit is for people with genetic hair loss, is there anything they can do to reduce the speed at which they lose their hair or, you know, the, the final result of their hair loss? Or is it something that, you know, there's there's not actually much you can do and it's about coming to terms with it? Uh, no, not at all. So there, there certainly is the range of options if you want to be really proactive. And the first thing to say is that genetic hair loss um, and the treatments for genetic hair loss primarily are aimed at preventing or slowing down progression. That has to be made very clear that that is the primary aim. Now, it doesn't mean to say that you can't get additional growth. And in fact, you know, a fair proportion of patients who continue with long-term treatment do get additional density, but your primary aim is to slow down and halt the progression, which is why if you start at an early stage, you're going to fare better than if you started much later down the line. And I think it is getting that message across to the general public that if you are somebody who doesn't want to continue with the sort of, you know, embrace the balding process and you'd like to halt it, there is actually a lot that can be done. So the licensed treatments for male pattern balding is topical minoxidil, which in the foam formulation is, is Regain, which you can buy over the counter. And the other licensed product for male pattern balding is the tablet Finasteride, or the brand name is Propecia. And the two things work very well together, and it, it can be very successful in halting progression of male pattern balding. Now, in women, the only licensed, officially licensed product is topical minoxidil, which is used in the same manner as it is with men, but it's just once daily as opposed to twice daily. And again, that, when started early, can halt progression. There are obviously a host of other off-license medications that can be prescribed to you from your dermatologist, which aren't officially licensed for genetic hair loss, but can work. So I think if you really want to be proactive about it, definitely see your doctor, your dermatologist to have a discussion about the options. Now, that's just the medical treatments. There are obviously you know, hair transplants, which have been widely publicized after lots of high profile people, mainly footballers coming forward, showing their befores and afters. And of course, it's a great option to have, but not everybody is the right candidate. And you have to make sure you do your homework and ensure that you are in the hands of a reputable surgeon um, who will be able to tell you what your likely cosmetic result is. And then also not forgetting cosmetic options. So some patients really just don't want to be on anything medical long term, and that's completely their choice. But there's lots of you know, non-medical options that you can consider. So for example, scalp micropigmentation, which is when you have essentially a tattoo applied to the scalp, the area of thinning, almost like a, a scalp camouflage. And of course, there are these hair fibers that you can dust onto the area of thinning, again, as a scalp camouflage. So there's, there's actually lots of things that you can do. So if you want to be proactive about it, then, then do speak to your doctor about what can be done and, um, and just know what your options are. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's really good just to lay that out because I think that a lot of people can feel a little bit helpless and suffer in silence. So, yeah, really good just to lay out what you can do. So you mentioned diet there. One thing that I see, you know, advertised all over the place is sort of vitamin supplements. Mm -hmm. 
So do those have a role to play in helping, you know, with hair health? Say if you've got a genetic baldness, would that potentially help slow the rate at which you're losing your hair or are you fighting a losing battle there, do you think? Well, I'll take the first part of the question first in that we know that hair obviously is a very sensitive barometer of your general nutritional status. And we see examples of where people are deficient in certain vitamins, minerals, or macronutrients, like if they've gone on a carb-free diet and they'll present with hair shedding or changes in their hair texture. So we, we know that nutrition is important. But what I would say is that I don't really advocate, and there isn't really any great evidence to support just supplementing for the sake of supplementing in the absence of a deficiency. So certainly if you have a hair problem, seeing your GP to, to get some blood tests to make sure that things like your iron, your vitamin D, your zinc is all replete, that's the first step that I think needs to be done is to actually get some blood work done and see if you are deficient. Now, if you are deficient in any of those nutritional elements, then by all means, supplement them until they're back up to range. But there is really no evidence strongly to suggest that there is any improvement in your general hair health by just supplementing even if you have no deficiency. The other thing is that obviously the supplement industry isn't regulated in the same way as a prescription drug. So it just needs to pass the safety standards as set out by the food standards agencies. And so the marketing claims are not very tightly regulated. And the problem is that supplements are so readily accessible that very often I'll have patients with 10, 15 different supplements they bring to clinic to show me they've already started and nothing's helped with their hair. And more importantly, I think people don't realize that over supplementation of certain nutritional elements can actually be more hazardous because they can interfere with the interpretation of some other lab tests. So for example, things like your thyroid hormone, sex hormones, as well as this marker for a heart attack, troponin, can all be affected by taking too much biotin. And we know that biotin is everywhere when it comes to hair and nails. So I think it's not very well known amongst the general public that there can be hazards with over-supplementing. That's really good to highlight. I mean, yeah, it's, it's something that I hadn't considered at all, but I always had a slight suspicion that they weren't necessarily be all and end all. Whilst we're sort of looking at the, um, the world of hair myths, uh, you know, maybe I'm being a bit harsh calling vitamins supplements a, a myth, you know, unevidenced claims. Are there any myths that you would particularly like to bust at the moment? I mean, the one that springs to mind for me is this idea that often said to men that you have the same hair as your mother's dad. Um, and so, you know, if he's bald, then you're going to be bald and vice versa. Is there any truth to that? Um, no, there isn't. And it's because common balding or androgenetic alopecia is what we call polygenic. So there's actually lots of different genes which contribute to your overall genetic risk. I mean, there are some which are stronger than others. And the one that basically governs the androgen receptor, so the receptors that sit on your hair follicles that pick up male hormone, that's probably the one of the stronger genetic associations. But it is by no means the only gene that is associated with the common balding. And actually, the inheritance pattern is therefore quite complicated. And so it can come from either side of your family and it can skip generations. And yes, it can be passed on to men and women as well. So um, unfortunately, that is a myth. That does not surprise me. Uh, it seemed just too neat to be true. Hair loss can be very difficult for people to come to terms with, I imagine. So is it common for you to see patients who have a hair disorder that also experience some sort of psychological distress as well? Oh, very common. Um, I mean, hair grooming is part of your daily routine. And it's also when you have hair loss, it's very difficult to hide that from people. And how you style and wear your hair is part of your identity. And for some people, it may have really important uh, religious or cultural significance. So hair is never just hair. Um, and it does mean something very different to each and every one of us. And I think, you know, we do see patients who unfortunately become quite psychologically damaged as a result of, of their hair loss. And they have very far reaching consequences, which can affect, you know, their ability to get work, their work performance, their personal relationships. And, you know, sometimes you do see patients just spiral into this 
cycle of anxiety and, and depression and social avoidance as well. So really going out of their way to avoid meeting people or putting themselves into a situation where their hairpiece or their wig may come off and, and it will be revealed that they, they have a hair problem. It's often wrought with so much shame that people feel really guilty about being bothered by their hair um, and also feeling guilty about seeking help for it because they'll say, oh, you know, I've been told, you know, I'm not dying from anything. I'm otherwise well. I shouldn't be feeling this way, but it is making me feel absolutely awful. And that is a very common sentiment and a common narrative that I see for a lot of patients. So I think, you know, as physicians, when we see patients with, with hair loss, it's important to tap into that and explore how much it's affecting that patient and as appropriate signposting them to the relevant level of support. And as I mentioned before, it might be as simple as, you know, introducing them to charities and support groups or signposting them to relaxation techniques. But in more severe cases, it may require a more formal referral to psychological services. Yeah, I think it's something that's really important to talk about because like you say, you do see a lot of people carrying around feelings of shame. And I think that's so often linked to feeling, you know, this idea that it's cosmetic, that maybe you're being vain or, or something like that. But as you say, it plays such a huge part of your identity, your hair. You know, you only have to think about, you know, if you're not somebody that's suffered from any form of hair loss, you only have to think about how you feel after a, a haircut you're not happy with or or how different you look if you shave your hair. I don't know if anybody did that during lockdown, but um, it can really change how you look and feel as, a, as an individual. So I do think it's really important to talk about it. I guess one of the problems is that different people react very differently. And for some people, it's just very much, a, oh, I'm totally relaxed about it. But that doesn't have to be the universal way to deal with it and feel, you know, how other people feel shouldn't invalidate your own. So yeah, I think it's really important to give people that kind of support and so on. And talking of that, one thing that we will do on our social media channels, so at Derm Tested on Instagram and on Twitter, is maybe share some links to some patient support groups and patient information leaflets on this topic, you know, just to, to get the ball rolling for people perhaps. But if that doesn't feel quite right for you, then there's also lots of Facebook groups out there can be very helpful and I think it is often useful to you know as we've said before in other episodes to get the perspective of other people who've been through what you're going through and can help support you so yeah we'll share those on our social media channels so thank you so much for coming on today Sharon I mean that was really interesting and you know there's a huge amount of information to cover so thank you so much that was brilliant yeah, thank you, Sharon. That was uh, really interesting and actually a really broad range of tips for all sorts of versions of hair loss. So, yeah, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Our guest was Dr. Sharon Wong. As today's episode was quite long, we're not going to waffle on, um, but we hope you learnt lots of helpful stuff and that you tune in for the last episode of the season in two weeks' time. 